On the 22nd of June, Germany attacked the Soviet Union under the code name Barbarossa. Three and a half million Axis troops crossed the border. The Germans had around 143 infantry divisions, 17 panzer divisions and the bulk of the Luftwaffe. In total around 3,400 tanks supported by 2,000 plus planes. They were divided into three main groups. Army Group North, Army Group Center and Army Group South. Opposing them were the Red Army with 2.5 to 3 million men at the front. They had 11,000 tanks and up to 9,000 planes. They would mobilize and replace losses in men during the operation, but losses in equipment like tanks would hamper their operations, especially towards the end of 1941 and for their counterattacks in early 1942. The German armies would quickly push into the Soviet Union, but logistical problems would hamper their attacks. After July it turned into stop and go as supplies and infantry units had to catch up with the armored forces. Even so, they managed to encircle large Red Army concentrations. At Minsk, they captured some 300,000 Red Army prisoners. At Smolensk in July, they took 200,000 prisoners. Being now only 320 kilometers from Moscow, having advanced 500 kilometers, they diverted south. By September they had created a new pocket around Kiev, taking around 520,000 prisoners. Time was now running out for the Germans to reach their goals. One of the goals was to capture Moscow. By October they struck, surprising the Red Army and capturing 600,000 Red Army troops at Vyazma. The German army was now worn down, the supply situation was poor and the weather started to turn. At the same time fresh Red Army units kept appearing. Even so they almost reached Moscow by the 2nd of December. But four days later the Red Army counterattacked. The weather was increasingly cold and the German soldiers and machines lacked the proper equipment for winter conditions. The German army had winter gear and equipment, not for all troops but for maybe between 30 to 50 divisions. However, the lack of transport capacity meant that ammunition and food would take priority. And so the German army had to take the cold weather in summer uniforms. On the 18th of December, Hitler gives the halt order, meaning no retreats. They should hold at all costs. The Red Army's winter offensive and Hitler's stand firm order would create a winding front. In places there was no clear front line with Red Army units and German units intermingled. One force would almost encircle the other force and the other force in turn encircled them. Uh, to the north around Lake Ilman there were difficult terrains for both attackers and defenders. The supply situation would be a major bottleneck for both forces. For the German 16th army, the roads were small and difficult to traverse. The Soviet forces struggled even more with the lack of good roads. 1st to 10th of January The commander of the 16th army is General Hansen. He has deployed his 10th corps close to Lake Ilman 
and tying in to the east with that core is the second core. The German 123rd Infantry Division to the far east is holding a thinly held front with some not mutually supporting strongpoints in the north and two undersized battalions holding the eastern part. The Soviet commander of the northwestern front is General Kurishkin. Under him is General Lieutenant Morozov in command of the 11th Army. Kurishkin orders Morozov to launch an offensive against the German forces east of Lake Ilmen. Morozov assigns the 180th and the 188th Rifle Division to the offensive. They manage to build ice roads to create a narrow supply corridor towards the German lines. At the same time, the Soviet Third Shock Army under General Porakev moves into the area in front of the German 123rd Infantry Division. The Soviet logistics are not capable of supplying the troops, so the Red Army soldiers will be lacking both food and ammunition. 7th of January. Part of the 180th Rifle Division attacks direction Redja, while part of the 188th Rifle Division attacks direction Visvad. Meanwhile, the 34th Red Army starts probing attacks against the German 30th, 12th and 32nd Divisions to fix them in place. 8th of January The German position at Wiesbad finds itself encircled while Russian forces strikes towards Staraya Rusa. The 16th Army, having limited reserves, can only send one battalion to block the Russian advance at Redja, and some artillery is sent to Parfino. The German army manages to capture some Red Army soldiers attacking Wiesbad, revealing that a major Soviet offensive is in progress. 9th to 11th of January the German 290th Infantry Division falls back, while the Soviet 84th and 182nd Rifle Division attacks in the direction of Staraya Rusa. This is the main supply hub for the German forces in this area. Two German battalions dig in between Anuchino and Sloboda. They are attacked and soon forced back towards Parfino. The 254th Rifle Division, 34th Army, attacks the right flank of the 290th German Division. The German company-sized strongpoints are encircled and captured, forcing the right wing of the 290th Infantry Division back, separating it from the German 30th Infantry Division. The 3rd Shock Army attacks with ski troops over Lake Seligar, followed by three rifle divisions, the 23rd, 33rd and 257th. One rifle division attacks a German strongpoint, but it is repulsed on the 10th of January. The next day will see additional Red Army attacks in this area, but they are also repulsed. On the left wing, two Soviet rifle division attacks and then moves behind the German lines. The 4th Shock Army is massing around Ostashkov. The 360th Rifle Division attacks the German 123rd Infantry Division. The rest of the army is moving towards Toropets. On the 10th of January, the 249th Rifle Division attacks and surrounds Peno. The German garrison will hold out until the next day. By then they have suffered 30% casualties and they are running out of ammunition. They break out towards the German lines. 12th to 15th of January A Russian reinforced regiment manages to envelop Staraya Rusa 
and enters parts of the city. A German counterattack destroys the Red Army Regiment. The German 189th Infantry Regiment from the 81st Division is tasked with blocking the 4th Shock Army. They move from Toropets towards Penno, but halfway there they run into the 249th Rifle Division. Both sides suffer heavy casualties. Russian forces continue attacking and envelop the German force. The German regiment tries to break out, but that fails. Only around 160 men will manage to get back to the German lines. 15th to 24th of January. Soviet artillery hits Staraya Rusa. The bulk of the German 81st Division is now in a blocking position at the city. Parts of the division counterattacks and stops the attack by the Soviet 84th Rifle Division. The 3rd Shock Army launches a heavy attack in the Lake Seligar area, but German artillery breaks up the attack. The 257th Rifle Division attacks direction Kolm and makes steady headway. The German 12th Division sends a Kampfgruppe to halt the Soviet advance. The German 123rd Infantry Division is now under heavy pressure and it is forced to retreat towards Demyansk. The 3rd Shock Army now sends one division after the retreating German 123rd Division. Two other divisions move towards Kolm and the rest of the army attacks direction Velkiluki. The 4th Shock Army reaches Toropets on the 20th of January. The city is defended by 2,500 German troops. They are soon pushed out and the intact stores of food and fuel are captured by the Red Army. These captured supplies will allow the Soviet Army to continue its advance. The temperature on the 18th of January is down to minus 43 degrees Celsius. Two battalions from the German 123rd Division and other assorted German units converge at Holm on the 16th of January. On the same day, parts of the German 216th Division, which is still in transit from France, reaches Locnia. One battalion from the 386th Infantry Regiment and the Regimental HQ are unloaded at Locnia and they are directly sent to Holm on trucks. The rest of the force will follow as soon as transports are again available. 17th to 18th of January 800 partisans attacks Holm, killing a large number of German soldiers and destroying all the trucks in the city. The next day, the partisan force pulls back, leaving some snipers behind. 21st of January. The Third Shock Army attacks Holm. They are repulsed, but the attacks will continue. The supply situation inside the city is growing ever worse. By the middle of March, the soldiers will live on one-third rations and they are running out of ammunition. The town is more or less surrounded, but the ring is weak. Some minor German company-sized reinforcements manages to reach Holm. 31st of January A small German relief column is sent towards Holm but they are stopped by Soviet forces with heavy casualties. This force now goes on the defensive, but they move all their artillery far forward to be able to give artillery support to the Holm defenders. First to the 8th of February. The German ad hoc formation Gruppe Leopold is tasked with holding the river crossing at Davidovo. 
First, it's based only on one battalion from the 368th Regiment of the 281st Sicherung Division. Later, it will be reinforced with a second battalion. The Soviet 1st Guard Rifle Corps tries to take the crossing with the 14th and 15th Rifle Brigades, but the attack fails. The main part of the 1st Guard Corps starts pushing towards the road leading to Holm. On the 7th of February, the Soviet 7th Guard Rifle Division mounts a well-coordinated attack and forces Group Leopold to pull back. By the 8th of February, the Soviet 1st Rifle Corps captures Ramushevo. The only real possibility to supply the German 10th and 2nd Corps is now via air. The situation is dire for the German troops inside the Demyansk pocket. The SS Totenkopf division is split into two Kampfgruppe. The larger Kampfgruppe named Aisha is sent to Seleucia. Kampfgruppe Simon is tasked with holding the old front line. What is left of the 123rd Infantry Division is reinforced with units from the 12th German Division. To the north, the 290th Division is continuously attacked by Soviet forces and it is almost cut off from the main pocket. It gets permission to pull back from Pola, having suffered so far 1400 casualties. 8th to the 28th of February. The Soviet 2nd Guards Rifle Corps is directed to strike direction Peno and then to attack west. On the 8th of February, two rifle brigades capture Peno. They and the 8th Guard Rifle Division pushes southwest. The 1st Shock Army is now assigned to the front deployed to help the southern attack and to widen the breach between the pocket and the main German lines. It attacks in the south with the 2nd Guard Rifle Corps direction Staraya Russa. Meanwhile, three German divisions are being transferred to the area. The first to arrive is the 5th Leicht Division or Light Division and it manages to help halting the Soviet attacks. On the 9th of February, the German Luftwaffe has started a small-scale airlift into Demyansk, but they only managed to deliver 16 tons. The next day they managed to deliver 27 tons. The pocket will require a minimum of 300 tons per day. 18th of February, Colonel Fritz Morsik, head of the German air transport, takes command of the operation to supply Demyansk and Holm. He agrees that air supply can be maintained if the following conditions are met. He will require at least 150 operational aircraft. In this sector they have 220 such aircraft, but only between 30 to 75 Junker 52 are operational in January. So what is needed is more transport planes diverted from other sectors. He needs an enhanced ground staff to keep the aircraft operational. For example, staff to warm the engines in the bitter cold, repair shops and so on. Thirdly, he needs a single command for all forces handling the airlift to simplify and increase effectiveness. The severe cold weather will make any open field maintenance of airplanes very difficult. His plan is accepted and German planes are assembled in Pleskau, Riga, Dagupils, Ostrov. The target airfields will be at Demyansk and a smaller airfield called Pieski. The air supply would also include airdrops. The Holm pocket has a very small airfield, but that is under constant artillery fire. Losses of transport aircrafts in this pocket 
would mean that supplies would mostly be airdropped or sent in via gliders. The German airplanes will mainly fly from Peskov and Ostrov, 250 km, to the main pocket. Each Junker 52 could carry about 2 tons of supplies. 150 missions per day are required. The Soviet Air Force would at first not intercept the transport planes, but soon lone Soviet fighters would attack Junker 52 planes. During February 12 such planes are lost. At Holm, a last ditched attempt to use the airstrip is done. Seven Junker 52 takes part, four are destroyed. After that, very few planes land in Holm pocket. 21st of February. The Soviet 130th Rifle Division and two brigades attacks the German strong point west of Holm and after two days they push the German forces back, ending the artillery support it had provided to the pocket. 24th of February. Two Soviet divisions, the 33rd and 391st Rifle Division, attacks Holm. They are supported by one brigade. The Soviet forces push us into the city, but they do not manage to capture vital buildings and are finally pushed back. The pocket holds, but the supply situation is not good. Soldiers are down to 300 grams of bread per day. The civilian population still inside the pocket gets even less. 25th of February. The 3rd Shock Army strike Seleucia together with the 1st Guard Corps and captures the city. The same day the 7th Guard Rifle Division attacks the Dimiansk pocket, striking east. That attack is repulsed, but German units suffer 60% casualties in the process. March. The German airlift is in full swing, supplying Demyansk and Holm. By the middle of March, the operation had 50% of all transport aircrafts assigned to it. The airlift was now contested and 52 Junker 52 planes are destroyed during this month. The delivered supplies would meet the minimum requirements for Demyansk. At Holm they were just barely sustaining the German forces. Stavka decided that eliminating the Demyansk pocket would fall solely on the northwestern front. The commander, General Kurishin, created a complicated plan to eliminate the pocket in days. By striking the airfields with infiltrated airborne troops, plus attacking the pocket from the outside at the same time, he thought it would fall like a house of cards. The Soviet 1st Airborne Corps was subordinated to the Northwestern Front. Several brigades will infiltrate the pocket during a week. One battalion of the 204th Airborne Brigade is parachuted into the pocket, landing northwest of Demyansk. It is in place to create a landing zone and base for the rest of the brigades. On the 6th of March, the 1st Airborne Brigade infiltrates the pocket in the hinge between the German 290th and the 30th Infantry Divisions. German forces realizes that the infiltration is ongoing and prepares for the next one. The two following Soviet airborne brigades are hit with artillery fire and sustain heavy casualties as they infiltrate into the pocket. The Soviet airborne troops lack both food and ammunition, but they have managed to assemble north of Demyansk. Parts of the Kampfgruppe Simon is diverted to defend the airfields. 19th of March. The 1st and 204th airborne brigades attacked the Demyansk airfields, despite having almost no ammunition at this point. They sustain heavy casualties and the attack fails. 
the 3rd Brigade attacks the rear of the German 30th Infantry Division. But that attack also fails, as the attack from the outside of the pocket never takes place. Kampfgruppe Simon chases the now retreating airborne troops. In the end, only 900 out of 8,500 soldiers manages to get back to Soviet lines. 21st of March. German forces under General Siedlitz launches an attempt to break into the Demyansk pocket. The 5th and 8th Leicht Infantry Divisions, Light Infantry Divisions, are the main striking force. They run into the 254th Rifle Division. At the same time, the weak 18th Motorized Division is protecting the northern flank. As the southern flank extends, the 122nd and 329th Infantry Divisions are sent to protect it. In doing so, they capture Sokolovo and Osedovo in the process. 23rd of March. The Soviet 33rd Rifle Division attacks Holm in force. The fighting continues until the next day with German forces almost being overrun. They especially have difficulty countering the Soviet tanks. They manage to hold on and Russian forces pull back the next day with heavy casualties. 27th of March. German forces continues attacking towards the Demyansk pocket. A Soviet counterattack by the 69th Tank Brigade temporarily halts the German attack. By the end of March, German forces have not managed to capture Ramushevo and they are still 20 kilometers from the Demyansk pocket. The supply situation is difficult for the Soviet forces as the road network and the front makes it problematic. They are actually in a worse situation outside the pocket than the German forces within the pocket. April. The spring thaw makes any movement difficult and it makes it even harder to supply the different forces. The Germans attacking towards Demyansk starts building a corduroyed road to carry supplies on. A difficult and slow task. 14th of April, the German relief force moving towards Demyansk is now attacking Ramushevo. It is defended by the 7th Guard Rifle Division. Fighting is hard. However, by the 21st of April, German forces manages to capture the city. And soon thereafter, they manages to link up with German forces inside the pocket. The roads are so bad and the corridor so narrow that the pocket will continue being supplied via air for a long time. The battle for Demyansk has been a costly operation. The German 2nd and 10th Corps have suffered some 63,000 casualties, including 17,000 dead or missing. The Red Army's northwestern front has since their counterattack suffered 245,000 casualties, including around 88 to 90,000 dead or missing. By the end of April, Operation Green or Operation Green under General Lieutenant Victor Lang is launched to relieve the pocket at Holm. The operation consists of the 218th Division, one regiment from the 122nd Division and tanks from the 8th Panzer Division. Blocking them is the 8th Guard Rifle Division and the 71st Tank Brigade. The German force makes steady progress towards Holm during heavy fighting. The Soviet commander Purakhev decides to launch a final assault against the Holm pocket. Heavy artillery hits the pocket before three Soviet regiments from the 3rd Shock Army attacks the city. 
the Soviet forces penetrates the front, reaches the airfield, and heavy fighting continues from the 30th of April until the 1st of May, when the Soviet forces are forced to retreat. On the 5th of May, the relieving force reaches the beleaguered German forces in Holm, and the siege is lifted. The siege had lasted 105 days, and the German force had suffered 60% casualties. The Third Shock Army, meanwhile, had suffered between 20 to 25,000 casualties. The lifting of the siege of the Demyansk pocket did not stop the airlift. The poor road conditions would mean that the air supply was still in effect at a lower rate when the German forces at Stalingrad were surrounded. The Soviet forces would continue to try and cut the narrow corridor into Demyansk all during 1942 with successive offensives. By the winter, the Soviet forces had suffered an additional 300,000 casualties. By February 1943, the German army decided to evacuate the salient, as no new reinforcements could be expected, and the air transport capability had been degraded. By early March of 1943, they had completed the evacuation. The losses from the start of the Russian winter offensive until the Germans pulled back were staggering. The Northwest Front had suffered some 600,000 casualties, with around 200,000 killed. The German 16th Army had some 188,000 casualties with 48,000 killed. As an ongoing battle, it was one of the major ones during World War II. The fact that the Luftwaffe could supply the two corps was a lesson the Germans should not have learned. They never really conducted a review of why the airlift worked and what problems it had and what could be learned for the future. When the Demyansk airlift started, it was Göring, without any knowledge of supplies, planes or terrain, who promised it could be done. The fact that it was possible came down to several German advantages. The two German corps were not at full strength. The Germans had enough airfields to use outside the pocket, and they had airfields inside the pocket. The air transport fleet had not been worn down, and the Soviets could not put up a truly effective air defense to stop the air supply. Even so, a substantial number of planes were lost, maybe half of the annual production of Junkers 52. All the time they struggled to keep the 300 tons supplied. Until the pockets were broken into, the Luftwaffe would fly 14,000 plus sorties. They delivered 24,000 tons of supplies, flew in 15,000 replacements, and evacuated some 22,000 wounded. Between 116 to 265 planes were lost during this operation. 140 planes were badly damaged and they lost at least 350 air crews. As late as the 15th of May 1942, two-thirds of the supply requirements for the Second Corps were still being fulfilled via air supply. Several problems were encountered by the Luftwaffe. The intense cold made it difficult to maintain aircraft. Wear and tear increased, rubber would crack, water freeze, and so on. The integration with other services, air or on the ground, did not always work. One time, when Morisic asked the Luftwaffe's fighter wing 
What was the best route into the pocket to avoid Soviet fighters? He was advised to take the route that would avoid Soviet fighters. Not really helpful. When Soviet airborne troops landed in the pocket, and that was known to the German defenders, no one informed Morisi. That led to several Junkers 52 being badly shot up by Russian ground troops. Something that could have been avoided. In the beginning, Morsik had a hard time getting troops to unload the plane inside the pocket. That was later rectified. Many other problems would occur during this operation. The airlift was a success in the fact that it kept the two pockets going. Overall, the fact that the German troops were caught in a pocket and had to be supplied via air seems to have been an unnecessary depletion of resources. When German forces were encircled at Stalingrad, the reduced airlift to Demyansk was still ongoing. Stalingrad would require 700 tons, having fewer airfields and more Soviet anti-aircraft and fighters in the area. The military benefit in holding the Demyansk front before the pocket was formed is questionable. One could argue that the German lines risked falling apart during the Soviet winter offensive of 1941 and early 1942. So standing firm seems logical. Falling back, as was requested, would have shortened the front. It would have saved the German air capacity for other regions and freed up badly needed forces for other parts of the front, which would seem as a better course of action. Holding the salient between 1942 to 43 one can argue it inflicted huge casualties on the Red Army. But it also tied up German forces that could have been better used elsewhere. Two to three extra divisions in the south could have made a difference during 1942. Protecting the 6th Army flank before the Stalingrad pocket would have been a better use of those forces. For the Red Army, after it had created the pocket at Demyansk, which was an impressive tactical feat, they failed to eliminate it. They neglected their own supply lines, ending up with forces outside the pocket having fewer supplies than the forces inside. They repeatedly attacked Demyansk in a predictable way and so gained little except extra casualties. The benefit for the Red Army was tying up German forces that could have been used in the south during the later part of 1942. For the Holm pocket, the Red Army diverted too many troops to other areas and so lacked the force to eliminate the pocket. Had they taken it, it could have opened up a route to strike behind Army Group North but instead of concentrating their forces, they dispersed them. One could say, as an airlift, it was a success for the Germans, and they stabilized the front during the winter of 1941-42. Looking at the whole campaign between 1941-43, to it was rather a loss for both sides. The German army had to divert badly needed troops to this sector in holding a salient that made little military sense when they decided not to attack Moscow in 1942. The fact that the pocket was formed at all and that the German 16th army was not allowed to retreat was a mistake. The Soviet Union kept racking up casualties that were not motivated by the number of German forces they tied down. The Germans claimed a victory 
the Soviets also claimed victory, but in fact, I would argue that they both lost the Battle of Demyansk.